I think what we can probably all agree on one thing in this room is that we are all creative geniuses whose who's very, um, very conception should be immediately bought and circulated around the world. But of course, the reality is the world doesn't think of us that way. The world thinks of us essentially as car salesmen who have to sell stuff for a living. And that's what this session is really about. It's about the brutal, um, unmitigated horror of actually having to try and sell things to people, and possibly even worse, having to listen to people sell things to you. That was a picture often, so I remember most in competitive when uh, there are three companies and they've all got similar ideas, so it's a fight. So um, I sent an AP to learn how to synchronize swim, because I always think what you have to do is take, <laughs> away, um, take away their arguments before they can make it. And their first argument would be, can you get to a competitive level? Yes, because we made a research uh, AP do it. Uh, she lost a dress size in six weeks, so she was happy. Um, and then the next thing is, is it entertaining? So you cut together a great tape and all that kind of thing. And then how do you bring it to life? And so we um, booked some synchronized swimmers. But what we hadn't thought through is that the pitch was going to be in a basement room in the old television centre with no lights, no space, and an enormous table, which wasn't an awful lot of room to do synchronised swimming. And synchronised swimming is very hard to do without actually being in water. So, and mostly men don't do it, but we'd made this man <laughs> come in speedos, again rhinestoned, and the girl <laughs> in a swimsuit, and they had to do their moves, but the only place they could <laughs> do yeah, their moves the was on the table. Which is literally about there. Legs in <laughs> legs in Mark's yeah, face. I loved it. And at the end, <laughs> there was this kind of I'm deathly really silence and Katie Taylor just said, at least she tidied her lady garden. <laughs> <laughs> and they commissioned it. I left and it didn't get made, but you did buy it. Yeah, yeah, no, we, I, I was, it got my tick. But there's, um, we, you know, you do, but joking apart, you do look forward to Karen's pitch because you know that she's going to bring the, light, the format to life and she'll be very articulate about the show and she has reasoned a lot of arguments before she comes into the room. But um, we do get a lot of pitches with, involved dressing up. I don't know that. <laughs> because that's about me or my team or because we're in entertainment. And I think my favourite was celebrity bullfighting. <laughs> where, <laughs> yeah, you know what's coming. The, uh, the development team did come dressed as bullfighters and it was quite early days in my, <laughs> in my uh, job as controller and they did ask me to be the bull. And, uh, <laughs> and instead of going... You know, handing over to Carl or Sean, who was ever with me. You know, I said, yeah, I'll do that. And it was all about showing the techniques of bullfighting. But that's, that's, uh, but we get a lot of, you know, doctors, people dressing up as doctors. And we get a lot of, a lot of that. Bull on BBC One. It wasn't so much, we weren't going to kill a bull, but we were going to, uh, they were going to demonstrate the, the difficult techniques and the <laughs> choreography around bullfighting. We didn't commission it. So. Today was, I was the first female in the entertainment department for quite a long time when I first started. So, I, you know, started to meet all the indies and kind of get to know them. They started to pitch to me. And this one very powerful male exec producer, um, you can all probably guess, uh, came in to say hello and then pitched me this idea, which wasn't very good, it's quite, quite old-fashioned. And I said, oh, yeah, it's probably not the direction we're going in, it's quite old-fashioned. And he looked at me and he went, oh, I see what the problem is. And I said, what? He said, I probably need to pitch this to one of your colleagues because it's really funny but it's like male funny <laughs> and it's not girl funny so I don't think you're going to get it so you can imagine if you've ever pitched to me you can imagine how that went down. <laughs> um, Jonathan let's, let's, kick, let's finish the kickoff uh, stories with your first ever pitch surely that would have that would have been sort of a slow burn into the industry. Yeah, I'm, uh, well I'm sorry if you've heard this story before but it seems to sort of follow me around but my first ever pitch was um uh, with my then boss who was pitching at, uh, um, to this lady and we were sitting on a sofa and she was at her desk and um, during the pitch the commissioner was just staring quite avidly at my crotch and I thought I'd heard that women in TV were like quite proactive but I thought this is like quite extreme so I, <laughs> I, I, look, I looked over at my boss he was still pitching where I checked my flies it was all fine but when I turned back she was sort of like wincing in her chair like and um, I thought, there's something really, really gone wrong here. And I just put my hands down um, uh, into my crotch area, and because I, I cycled everywhere, the inside of my jeans had just completely split, and my left testicle had popped out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it hadn't... It wasn't, uh. it, it wasn't just popped out, it was ballooning and purple. <laughs> and because... It had popped out, and then I sat down. The blood had got cut off, so it had gone numb. <laughs> and I started desperately trying to push it back in. At which point, she didn't... I don't think she thought it was Tesco. It looked like some sort of Korean nuclear explosion in the sea. And um, I didn't see her again for two years, and I was at RDF. I saw her, 
And um, I said, oh, hello. And she just, you could just see the Tesco cogs slowly <laughs> sort of turning in her head. And um, funnily enough, we didn't get that commission. Um, that's a shame. So, of course, no, no TV pitch these days is complete without a completely spurious and bolted on interactive element. And um, everybody's been there. Uh, they never get made, by the way, the interactive elements. But, but we're, we're looking for some interaction today. So if you go on the Edinburgh Festival app, you can um, submit your own horrible pitch story. And uh, there's a complimentary prize of no fewer than three Snickers bars for the best story that we've submitted. So please send them in, and we'll, we'll look at them at the end. So just to, just to recap, you go to take part at the bottom and then to how not to pitch a show and then you put your little story in and submit it. We really would love to hear the stories because I'm sure there's some great ones. So let's, let's talk about the pitch process itself. You've got a great idea, you're ready to pitch it, the meeting's in the diary. Um, what are the best ways to use that hour? Let's set the scene by hearing from one producer, Ian Wimbush. Massive pitch for ITV, biggest pitch I'd ever done. John K. Cooper, Elaine Bedell. We thought we were onto an absolute winner, mainly because John had come to us and said, please pitch us a magic show with this presenter who also happens to be a magician. And it was all poised. We'd done all the development. We were at the final meeting where we, maybe in our minds, we thought it's just kind of a rubber stamp. What we hadn't counted on was the presenter, who's also a magician, wanting to perform three or four tricks during the pitch to illustrate his skills and what he could do. Unfortunately, he could do none of the tricks that he'd pre-rehearsed, and every single one fell flat on its face. My God, we walked out of there and never been more convinced that we hadn't got a show commissioned. Um, it was truly awful. Did you get the show? No. <laughs> So, Saida, should, should you take the talent to the pitch? That's the key question. I think not in the first meeting. I think, I think the ideas are king when you're trying to um, pitch a show. And it's really hard to sit in a meeting with a bit of talent the very first time you've ever heard an idea and go, yeah, that's a really good idea, but I really... I don't like them. <laughs> so... It's or fine. Whatever. But it's really uncomfortable. I don't think you can have a, a proper, honest conversation, particularly with talent in the room. First time. But isn't it also the case that sometimes you can just turn up with the talent, say, I've got Paddy McGannis, and they'll say, whatever it is, we'll take it. Peter Kay, oh yeah, commission, irrespective of the idea. Oh, I like to think the idea is really important alongside the talent. So I, I, <coughs> that's what I do. Well, I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable. If, if you've got a, a big talent who wants to pitch you an idea and you're working with a big agent, you have to take the meeting. It's, it's unavoidable. Uh, but I, I would agree, if it is talent, ideally, you'd, that, that would be your second meeting. And, you know, it can be un uh, it's, it's unavoidable and, and often it's regrettable when they're there and it depends on, on the pitch. But um, uh, it can be useful to have the talent. It depends on the idea. You know, if it's a comedy end idea, then it's good to have the talent. Although I do remember once um, taking a pitch with a, a brilliant uh, comedian from the 80s and he wanted to meet, um, he was doing a gig and he wanted to meet the next morning in, in his hotel room. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, he was from the 80s, so I took an exec with me. And uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, so we did, we, we took the pitch in his, uh, in his bedroom, which was pretty unkempt. It was a bit of a mess, and the three of us, there, were no, there was nowhere to sit, so the three of us had to sit on the edge of his bed. It was all a bit uncomfortable <laughs> and a bit embarrassing and at one stage he said that when he's going to the toilet he's quite a while in the toilet and then he came out <laughs> and he the smell told us that he'd been there for a number two not a number one so it was all a bit um uncomfortable to say the least <laughs> but i have to say it was a good idea and we we wanted to pitch the idea but you, uh, yeah no talents uh, it's it's a tricky one having talent what about it? the production team do you want to see the whole team just the top people well what? we we do try and encourage uh, uh, top developers or producers to bring their juniors with them you know we like to hear we like them to hear from the horse's mouth what we're doing we like to meet the junior creatives in in their team uh, i mean my advice would be don't leave them on their own to pitch you know we have had junior members who you know can be quite a we try and make them as relaxed as possible, but they can be quite anxious. And, you know, we've had people who have virtually fainted during the pitch <laughs> or have sweated so much. And this is God's honest truth. We've had to stop the pitch to get them some paper towels <laughs> to uh, mop them down, you know. So, so we do... It is great to bring juniors in because it's good for them to experience. But do, you know, if you're a senior uh, producer in that team, do support them in their pitch. Karen, what about members of your family? Is that a good, is that a good idea? Mm -hmm. 
Not historically. Um, we, uh, <laughs> my husband still doesn't think it's funny. Um, we, um, again, <laughs> we did a big pitch. Um, it was called Scouting for Boys. And um, it's another bit of gold as you yeah. let slip through your fingers. Yeah. Um, it was 100 years of, of the scouting movement, so a big celebrity show. Uh, they go to Brownlee Island, and um, they live at sc as scouts. There's then a, a team of, of real scouts. They're competing in all sorts of scouting activities. It was at the time when Dangerous Book for Boys and all that kind of thing were big. And uh, they phone in now, and they can go out and do bobber jobs and things. And we thought, OK, we're going to really bring this to life and, and build a scout camp. And again, we ended up with a really shitty little room in the basement of um, a broadcasting house, and um, <laughs> they had a tent that they couldn't pitch because there was carpet, so there was this flaccid tent in the corner. And I made my <laughs> husband um, <laughs> and Sherpa Ian Holland, um, some people know, wear scout, <laughs> scout uniforms. <laughs> <And> <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, give out um, Kendall Mint uh, Cake. <laughs> uh, but they started the whole thing with the, yeah. with the scout salute and things. But it suddenly became apparent that they didn't want it, but we were trapped and you couldn't get out. And it was really so it was close and really in your face. Yeah. But Alan Yentov, for some reason, um, loved that idea. Yeah, he's obsessed with that. He is, and he kept calling me up for like months afterwards saying, can't we need to get them? Yeah. They don't want it. They really, really yeah. don't want it. My husband's barely speaking to me. <laughs> Mark's mortified. They're not mm. going to buy it. And I still think, similar to testicles, every time Alan sees me, he thinks, scouting for boys. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many people should you take, Saida? Um, as many as you need. Less is more. I don't think you should ever spend the first 15 minutes of any pitch meeting just saying hello to the people in the room. I think that's probably a bad idea. So I think it's always quite odd to have a lot of people because I think it's, you know, like over 10. Let's say double figures because I think it makes it difficult to have a good, honest conversation. But I think you should bring as many people as you think you need who are going to be involved in the idea. And what about pitching shows, not just to commissioners, but also to talent? Um, Jonathan, you, you've commissioned someone in the news business, haven't you? Yeah, when I was working at RDF, they used to have this huge boardroom, and um, they used to have a development team of 18 people. So when a talent or a commissioner came in, 18 people would sit around the table, and like, we'd all have to... It was really weird. Also, it's quite sort of threatening if you're a commissioner to come in and get sort of bombarded by these people. Anyway, um, we had Trevor McDonald come in, and he was sitting at the head of the table, and um, I was given this idea to go and pitch to him. As I was walking into the room with this piece of paper, walk in, sit down, I'm looking, I'm like, no, no, there's something wrong here. So I check my boss, and he's like, no, that's good. And um, anyway, it comes to me and says, like, Jonathan, what's your idea for Trevor McDonald? And it's like, it's called Trevor McDonald's Slave Ship. And I was like, <laughs> what's that? And um, the, the idea was Trevor McDonald goes to Africa, gets lots of Africans onto a slave ship and rows back round the slave route to see what it was like being a slave. And he looked at me, like, and was waiting for something else. And then he just started shuffling his papers and said, I think I want to do current affairs. And um, that was it. And then there was this, like, this whole sort of, like, tumbleweed in the room and we were all sitting there shitting ourselves. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> let's, hear, let's hear some more people on tape. This is some, we asked some commissioners and producers what was the worst thing that you can possibly say in a pitch, and these are the answers that they gave. The one thing you should never say in a pitch is, I'm going to pitch you 20 ideas. You just pick your favourite. I know you just said no, but can I just talk you through it again? By the way, whatever happened to that prick who used to run drama? Absolutely true. She looked at him and said, I married him. Don't say things like, oh yeah, that's what ITV said. It's, it's Top Gear, uh, but for fashion. Someone did go in and pitched a show which was about um, a, a sort of um, multiracial examination of farming in which a black family would farm years ago and the title that was actually proposed in the pitch meeting was Old Black Donald Had a Farm and the production company added and we have spoken and got in principle support from a black family called Donald who would like to do it. I think probably one of the worst things I don't like to hear is when this was turned down at Channel 4 or the BBC they said Nobody likes to be sloppy seconds, so I probably am, and that's fine, just don't tell me. Well, it's true, we, we get a lot of that, you know, we, this is, um, 
you know, it's been turned down. And, uh, or, or, or actually, we still get people who say, um, you know, my, our first loyalty is to BBC Entertainment. That's where our heart is. That's where our soul is. Uh, and then they'll pitch you a show, which, and then they'll leave you the paperwork, which has ITV on it. You know, so you still, it's quite remarkable that you, st you do actually still get that. Um, I it is, I mean, the worst thing that you can happen in a pitch is that you know they're going to bring more than three ideas. You know, and you just feel, how can they possibly have 20 ideas that they're passionate about and want to make? You know, my biggest piece of advice is don't bring more than three ideas. But isn't it also true that some commissioners say, just send me top lines and I'll get back to you straight away. Just send me a couple of lines and I'll give you an instant response, which sort of elicits the 20 idea thing, doesn't it? Well, I mean, I think it's fine. It depends what your relationship is and the dialogue you're having with the commissioner. I think if you're mm. having a pitch meeting, where I think, you know, we have different types of meetings where you can say we're going to brainstorm some top lines, you know, come in with some themes, with some ideas, and let's chew the fat. But if it's a pitch meeting where they're coming in saying we've got some ideas to pitch to you, no more than three. But is it ever slightly embarrassing if someone comes in with a kind of 27-page PowerPoint and a sizzle reel and all the rest of it, and then you just go, yeah, but the problem is I fundamentally didn't like the idea at all from the top? Yeah, but I think we have to get over that, actually, on a serious note. And sometimes you know, we book the hour, and if the meeting's 20 minutes, it's 20 minutes. Mm. Um, we try and we do say, look, you know, one of the reasons we say, let's, let's look at your top lines or let's look at areas so we can avoid that. We don't want you guys doing reams and reams of work and then for us to go, do you know what, we just commissioned that three days ago or we're not looking for monkey tennis. And you've done a lot of development. So we do try mm. and avoid that by saying, you know, send us your top lines before taking an actual pitch meeting. Because last year we did the sizzle reel session and I think everybody learned a lot from that. We saw the, the fantastic 50 ways to kill your mummy sizzle reel last year. Do you think sizzle reels are critical for getting shows sold today? Um, I think where the tone and attitude of the channel is important, yes, because then it, it might give you a sense that this uh, development team understand that. Uh, I don't think it's essential, you know, it still has to be a neat idea. What about you, Say? Did you like real sizzles? I love reels. Um, I, I, I don't think you need to have them to sell an idea, but I think sometimes it's really helpful. We're a visual medium, and I think if you can put something down on a tape that sort of just explains what you're trying to do, it's just really helpful to get a proper sense of it, especially in entertainment, I think, because everything's such a kind of, you know, tiny kind of idea in your brain that you can't explain. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's easier to explain it on tape, so I, I quite like tape. Well, the but worst it, thing is, sorry to interrupt, the worst thing, because you didn't ask me, the worst thing is when you've got a PowerPoint and the person comes and in just and, reads the and just reads the bloody I PowerPoint. <laughs> I hate that. And it's so annoying. Oh. And also, there's a pregnant pause after each page, so yeah. they'll do this. So you go, how not to pitch a show? <laughs> Next page. Um, this is the first chapter. <laughs> and and, what, and what I really I want to, to name someone who's actually had a lot of success, and but I won't. But, they, but they've come in Do with it. their PowerPoint and just read the bloody PowerPoint. The other thing that I think is really important not to do in a pitching session is to pitch ideas that are already on the channel. That's quite um, useful. I know that um, yeah. Jill Wilson, see here at the front, uh, told me how uh, someone came in when uh, the Dawn Porter vintage uh, show was on, who basically pinched, said, Dawn Porter's really interested in vintage fashion. You should do that. I think Jill just went, get out. And that, that was it. I mean, know, know what's on the channel. It's helpful. And how, how easy is it to just say no? Does it get easier with time, or is it embarrassing? I find it really easy. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I just think, if you don't like it in the room, just say it. It's much easier. It's, ki it's kinder to mm. say no in the room than to go, oh, yeah, it's a really good idea. Come back and do some more work. No, I, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, you know, producers say they encourage you to say no, but when you actually do get to say no, they go, oh, really? You go, yeah, it's, you know, as long as you can give a, a sentence as yeah. to why. But, yeah, it's much more useful to say, no, so we can all move on. And, exactly. uh, but you do get people who you know, say, yeah, I know you just said no, but and they'll go back in, you know. Awesome. An honest answer, if someone sends you a sizzle reel, how many seconds do you watch? All of it. Really? Yeah, unless it's a one and a half hour sizzle reel. <laughs> yeah, I'll watch all of it. And you? Well, yeah, unless it's a, you know, in the first sort of minute, you know, it's an idea you don't want, so. Interesting. Jonathan, have you ever said the wrong thing in a pitch? Uh, I have. Um, said the wrong in a pitch, yep. Um, um, 
What I find is quite alarming about this is that there are people taking notes about this. Which, um, <laughs> <laughs> and also, we were all shitting ourselves before you came in. We were all scanning the room for, like, are the people we're talking about actually yeah. here? Yeah. And, then, and then they put the lights down, and more people come and say, you're sort of, like, pitching in the dark, which is really bad. Um, I, had to, I had to go... Uh, to a channel, and we were pitching an idea called Flabberinas, and <laughs> Flabberinas uh, was um, uh, fat, 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 fat women try to like themselves and learn about themselves through the medium of ballet at the Royal Ballet School, which you may laugh at, but turned into <laughs> recent... This was like 10 years ago, but now Wayne Sleep's Big Ballet on ITV. Monkey tennis to be done one day. Anyway, so I, I was going to pitch Flabberinas, and I, was, I, I had never met this um, commissioner. So the, the, point, the point of this thing is do your research. Anyway, this commissioner um, turned up, and um, she's very lovely, not mentioning any names, but she is not a sort of stick insect. And um, I, was, I was sitting in the room waiting, and I heard this sort of, like, thud, thud, thud coming down the thing. And um, uh, down she sat on the sofa that almost broke. And um, so the meeting was going really, really well. And she goes, so you've, you've, you want to come in to talk about this idea? We had like half an hour sort of chat that you do. And I think commissioners do half an hour chat. So if they hate your idea, they just, they haven't got to sort of like leave after 10 minutes. Anyway, half an hour chat. She says, what's your idea? And I said, yeah, it's a really good idea. It's called fl <laughs> <laughs> And I had, I suddenly thought I was going to do it. And I just completely panicked. And I was got, went completely blind panic. And I said, it's called Spastics Can't Dance. <laughs> and, um, and she's like, she's like I'm sorry. I said, I said, I don't mean spastics like proper spastics. I mean, like, maybe you touch the downs or, like, you know, they're dribbling or they've got helmets on. At which point she, she had this notebook, like you've got, that she was writing. She just closed the notebook. And, um, and that, that was it. <laughs> However, <laughs> that show on BBC Three was dancing on... turned into Dancing on Wheels. I mean, spastics Can't Dance was dance... It, it's not that. But it was, was, was Dancing on Wheels. I'm sure it wasn't pitched in quite the same way. I was going to make an official BBC complaint. Yeah, you should. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so we've done PowerPoints and sizzles. Let's do, um, let's do props and stunts, uh, which I think are very much of the, of the minute. Let's have a look at a tape on that. I was pitching a show to BBC Three, to Carl Warner, and it was basically like a limo firm in Ibiza. The idea was we were going to launch a limo service in Ibiza and then follow people around as they hired them and the stories, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so what I thought was, I'll hire a limo and pitch the show to Carl in the back of a limo. This producer, um, uh, Joe Mace, um, came like, and pitched me in a limo, which is sort of very odd, because I, like, I've... I, I've sort of doubted my sexuality over the years, but like, it, was, it was sort of like coming on to me in a pitch in the back of this limo. Um, but actually, when you try and hire a limo for an hour in London's West End, they basically just think you're hiring it for sex. So when they turned up, that, and me and Carl got in the back of this limo, and I said, oh, just drive round for an hour, the man who was driving it was, just gave me that look, which was, I'm not going to ask any questions. So it got me in. And I can't remember what the idea was, but it just smelled of sort of sex in this car. Which is a tip. Don't, if you're going to pitch anywhere, make sure it smells like success and not like prostitutes. Yeah, that was a weird one. That was very odd. I didn't get that show. Karen, Karen you seem to be our expert on, on props and stunts. When does it work? When's it really paid off for you? Um, strictly. Um, uh, again, uh, we knew the barrier to... Um, Selling Strictly was is dancing, entertaining. Are people going to watch it? Um, and uh, the thing was, um, we hadn't explored the professional dancers yet, but so we just booked some really um, <laughs> scrubby, chubby salsa dancers from Shepherd's Bush. But um, their impact when they came in in all of their gear as a surprise in the middle of the pitch and, and, and gave it large in people's faces, um, getting them out again was, was, was the tricky bit. But it suddenly brought it to life. And actually, yes, dance is entertaining. Um, and, uh, God, we must have done that pitch about eight, nine, ten times, because then in every new territory, you then had to, to prove it again, um, uh, including to um, BBC Worldwide, who said it would never sell. It's not the biggest format in the world. They said only the British do um, ballroom dancing. Uh, no, they don't. Um, so, yeah, so it really worked strictly. And by the time you came to do it in, in Hollywood for the American one, had you really got it down, and did you use good dancers? And... <laughs> there were good dancers by then, yeah. Bless those sorts of dancers. I bet it's a big story for them. Yes. Yeah, they, I don't know what their names are, but bless you, whoever you are. Yeah. And so, you know, is Channel 4 too cool for people to come in with props and stunts, or do people do that to you? No, no, they come in. Um, one of the best props we 
have had was the cardboard box with letter boxes cut out and pound coins all taped up to do million pound drop and that brought that to life and that was really good but I have I, I've, the best story I've heard it's not props one it's a gimmick one was um, this commissioning editor from another channel um, who got a, a pitch from a producer a producer had come up with this idea it was a kind of this surveillance game show where you know you kind of watch and you don't realize you're being watched and you pick up the phone and you have to answer questions and there's money you know it's all like the game and um and this producer decided the best way to pitch the idea was to do the game on the commissioning editor so he arranged with his exec to put like a 10 pound note taped under the desk and he phoned up this commissioning editor <laughs> on his landline and said um well i'll call him alex connick for the purposes of this just went Alex Connick. And the official went, yes, who's it? Alex Connick, I'm watching you. <laughs> and he's like, who is this and why are you phoning me? We went, I see you're wearing a lovely blazer. Um, how's your daughter? And then said the, the guy's daughter's name. And the commissioner freaked out. I went, All right, I don't know who you are, but I'm, gonna, I'm getting the police on the phone now. It's like, call the police, call the police. The producer just put the phone down and never explained it. So to this day, I'm not sure that commissioning editor knows that that was meant to be a pitch. <laughs> Although he probably will now. Yeah. Mark, Mark, do you see a lot of a lot of stunts, props? Yeah, I mean, I had a. Um, I went out to have uh, just a lunch with an agent and uh, with John Nolan actually, and uh, I did. You know, I just thought it was going to be pleasant lunch and all that, and then. What, it, what the lunch was actually about was Lee Francis pitching his latest character to me. And uh, that was in a busy restaurant. And then what unfolded was a kind of scenario that this character, apparently this character and I had been in an argument for, and it sort of carried on into this restaurant. So <laughs> it, that was really embarrassing. I, sort of, I should have known better, but it was, um, yeah, I mean, you know, Lee carried it off really, really well, me less so. but. Uh, so, yeah, we get a lot of stunts, you know, as I said before, people dressing up. Uh, we do get um, character comedians coming through the door dressed in their character, and uh, that's quite... You have to embrace it and let your inhibitions go and just go with it. You don't okay. really do your butt clenches. As your butt clenches, and yeah. it's even worse when you're with a channel controller because you know they're going to think... You did this. I did this too. <laughs> you know. I remember once Lee, Lee Mack pitched me a show where it was called Evolution. I actually loved it. Well, it was a quiz show where you'd start uh, with the professor. And he would, if you beat the professor, then you'd go down. And then, you know, you'd go down to like a 12-year-old 12 12 year kid. And you had to beat the kid in the quiz. And then you ended up playing this monkey. <laughs> and then if you could beat the monkey, you know, you'd win <laughs> the money sort of thing. And I thought this was a fantastic idea. I was probably taken in by Lee Mack. You know, and then I pitched it on to Jay Hunt, who, well, you can imagine Jay's reaction. Never but, know, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's called, it's called evolution. <laughs> and when you, when it you, never got made. And Karen, when you did your back in the room, uh, did, did you do some hypno stuff on, on the commissioners? No, I, I accidentally punched Claire during the pitch, though. Um, <laughs> you know, I was getting so carried away trying to explain it and doing, you know, and the, the hypnotist, la, 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 and, <laughs> going, and in the end, actually, punched her in the arm. Still commissioned it. Um, no, don't do it. No, that's far too risky. But, far too risky. I would never take the talent into a pitch. I can't be trusted. You've done, you've done stump pitches, haven't you? Yeah, but I, I, I think um, <laughs> the, the times that that's happened has definitely never worked. And I've never done it myself. I mean, when I was an AP at RDF, again, there's 18 people and Ben Frow. I didn't see, the, I didn't see Ben Frow since that time. Um, but he sat at the end of the table and Grant Mansfield um, uh, I got back from holiday and he said, right, we're pitching this show called Naked Office Holiday, which interestingly then did get made, like, years later um, by someone else. Um, and he said, so we're going to go and pitch this in an innovative way, was his words, and you're going to wear speedos and a mask and snorkel and flippers, and we're going to put you in a photocopy cupboard, and you'll wait there until it's your time to come in. The runner will come and get you, <laughs> then you walk into the room, and you open your PowerPoint, and you pitch the thing. So I was like, are you sure this is a good idea? He said, yeah, yeah, it's going to be fine. So anyway... <laughs> I'm in their fucking photocopier cupboard for like half an hour. The runner comes to get me. I'm walking in. I'm so scared that I've shriveled penis-wise for an inch from my life. There's just like, there's no penis in the speed. There's just bush. And I've, I, 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 I walk into the room. Like, I can't see. My goggles are misting up. And I lift them up. And Ben Frow says, hang on, hang on. I just want to stop you there. He says, if you think... He says, firstly, I'd like to give you a formal apology because I think this is really out of order. And secondly, I want a written apology on my desk tomorrow from someone senior at the company because if you think you're getting a commission 
because you're in speedos and I'm gay, you've got another fucking thing coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, right, well, obviously I'm going to leave now. And Grant was like, let's go, let's go. So I was like, really? So I sat down, opened the PowerPoint. I was like, wouldn't it be interesting if we all got naked? Ben was like, no. <laughs> wouldn't it be interesting if we had to judge ourselves as an office on who was best naked on holiday? I was like, no. So I just shut the PowerPoint and then you're just sitting there again in silence. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> Let's have another tape. We, we, asked, uh, we asked the final tape. We asked uh, a number of people that the, what is the secret to the perfect pitch? I'm not sure there's an absolute secret because a good idea, even if badly pitched, is still a good idea. And I'd hope that we could see through a mumbly pitch. But the, possibly a secret ingredient is enthusiasm and passion. If you believe in the idea, there's much more chance I will. The secret to a perfect pitch is loving the idea you're pitching. So if you love it, you'll pitch it brilliantly. It won't take a lot to get passionate. You know, if you really love something, you'll pitch it well. So I think that's kind of, you know, the secret. Only pitch stuff you're passionate about. I would say the golden rule of pitching is just be prepared. Sounds really obvious. Be really prepared and make sure that you really, really like the idea. We've all tried to pitch ideas that we don't like and it doesn't work. They can tell you don't like it and then when they start raising objections, you're thinking, yeah, you're right, it's crap. You should absolutely believe in everything that you pitch, which usually means, if you really think about it, there aren't five ideas you want to pitch, there's actually only one. Always going to a pitch, loving your idea like a newborn baby. People will actually look you in the eyes and they'll say, only take stuff that you really believe in. And the truth is, it's not true. Take a variety of stuff, some that you believe in more than others, you're quite often surprised that the project that you like least, they like the most. So I don't believe it when producers say, only take stuff that you believe in. Now that'll come back to haunt me. Hope you're ready for the next episode, hey. A final, a final tip from our top panellists. Uh, what's the secret to a perfect pitch, Karen? Uh, um... I think it's uh, psychology and <laughs> a decent room to pitch it in. Um, just, yeah, uh, take away their objections before they can raise them and um, <laughs> bring it to life. And actually, you know what, never give up. I know these guys say quick no, but the number of times that you, uh, you can give up on an idea too soon, I think, um, and if, it, if it's good, stick with it. Mark? Yeah, I'd say, you know, I, I would say keep... If, if you're doing a, an ideas pitch, keep it to three ideas. I would say really think hard about the audience that you're pitching that show into and, and watch the output of the channel. And another thing I'd say is, is try, and be aware, you know, try and be aware of what that department has commissioned recently. You know, really, there, there's so many people who don't know the output of the channel that they're pitching into and don't really know what that department's commissioned recently. But my biggest thing is no more than three ideas, please. <laughs> Jonathan? Uh, I used to go and pitch a lot of ideas in a meeting at once because I thought that if they said no to all those ideas, they didn't like me or it was all, the, you know, that, that sort of rejection was sort of hard to take. And I think what changed is uh, since we started our company now, we, I'm sorry to say, don't really read briefs. And I think this thing that you go to one channel only with this, uh, I have to say I've been to different channels sometimes with... Um, uh, with ideas, but the, 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 the key difference about that is we all sit down and think, right, what do we want to do? Do we really want to do this idea? And what's interesting then is you go with a tape and you say, this is our one idea, and if the meeting ends after 10 minutes, so be it. But you go with that one idea and say, right, this is it, this is what we want to do. And if that, when that happens, it's quite interesting to see because you know that you love it and you know that it will probably work. And then some people just don't get it. And then it's not about you anymore. It's like, OK, you haven't got that. And some people go, um, I really love this. And then sometimes you have lots of channels bidding on it at the same time. Oh, you shouldn't say that. But that does, you know, the, the shows that we've loved most have Why had... Why shouldn't you say that? Yeah, well, because That's it, such a happened. British thing. It, no, is, it is a bit of a dirty word that you think, oh, you know, I'm just going, I'm just going to this one channel. Actually, if, when we had Pineapple, we had four people trying to bid on it. When we had GPs, there were three channels trying to get it. And that becomes quite an, that becomes quite an interesting sort of switch, I think, when you, it's no longer about whether they're rejecting you or thing. It's just like, well, do you like this or not? And I think the key thing is, it's not actually about getting a commission. It's about trying to find someone who you think, as a partner, you want to work with. Because nowadays, all the commissions at Channel 4 and things, they're going to be all over your show, like a rash, um, as a sort of another exec producer. So you've got to think, I want to work with that person. So there's some people you go into a pitch with and you think, actually, this is never going to work. You probably don't like me. I don't like you. It doesn't really matter about the idea. I think the thought of making a show with you is, like, <laughs> truly terrible. So... Um, <laughs> 
you know, we won't do this. And so there's probably only about six or seven people I really go and talk to because I think actually we probably get the same things. That many. And so, you know, what's your, what's your top tip? How to create? I haven't got much to add to that. I mean, I think, you know, I really believe in your idea. I mean, I know that for what Jim said, but I think that is really important. And also, just understand tonally what it is you're pitching to the channel. And also, I'd say a really big tip is to be sober. Um, <laughs> don't come in hungover or drunk, and then don't vomit into a paper cup halfway through your pitch. That's never a good idea. That didn't get commissioned that day. Um, but yeah, no, I think everyone knows. I mean, it's the same thing. Just you know, if you if it's if if you, it's a really good idea, we all, we just want to commission really good ideas, and it's just as it's as simple as that, really. OK, so earlier on, we asked you, the audience, to pitch us your best pitch stories uh, in competition for our glittering prize of three Snickers bars. And interestingly enough, we have, a, we have two good ideas. Uh, so we're going to make the people who sent them in pitch them. Uh, can we start with who sent us the idea on uh, the Christmas idea? Who was that? We both the anonymous. <laughs> Fiona's going to tell a story. Wow. You're a very hard act to follow, you lot up there. I've never laughed so much in a session in my life. Um, <laughs> so we were asked to pitch for um, uh, kind of two times one hour's kind of um, comedy travelogue to go out around Christmas. And we had the debate whether we come up with lots of ideas or just one really great idea. So we plumped for coming up with one really great idea, which we thought was a really great idea. And we hired somebody in, and we got them work it up. And it was about um, searching for Santa. So um, it is better than it sounds in the title. <laughs> and um, we went in to pitch this idea. And we said hello, and we'd just come back from holiday, and blah, blah, blah. And the commissioner said, yeah, I really wanted you guys to pitch for this slot because we didn't want to be pitched anything really naff, like searching for Santa. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, we had no other ideas with us that day, so we didn't really have anywhere to go. Uh, he says we pulled it back. I'm not sure we did, but there you go. Thank you for that. And we have a, somebody who sold a show successfully to Jane Root. Who's that? They may be looking to protect their anonymity, so I'm going to read this one out. Oh. <laughs> I'm afraid it's another testicle story, and Jonathan and I obviously need to catch up. <laughs> I, too, have pitched with a testicle hanging out. Uh, <laughs> but Jane Root preferred my testicles, and she commissioned the show, so it turns out it's all about the quality bollocks you pitch. <laughs> So there you go. This is a democracy. So who's going to vote for the Christmas um, Searching for Santa story? <laughs> and who's voting for the, um, the bollocks story? <laughs> That's our winner. Thank you very much. Um, the three bells of Snickers go to you, sir. Perhaps you give one to Jonathan as well. Um, so thank you very much to Karen, Mark, Jonathan, and Seda. Thank you very much to the audience. Thank you. <laughs>